Dr. Andrew Yun at St. John's, and in this brief discussion, we're going to review balance of the posterior cruciate ligament total knee replacement. Balancing the PCL has been one of the most challenging aspects of total knee replacement, and we're now using quantitative methods to achieve the most symmetric and rectangular flexion gap. As you can even see from our early comments, this will be a very technical discussion. Uh, it's not necessary for people who are learning about knee replacement. This is mostly for those who are interested in the anatomy and the mechanics of soft tissue balancing. So backing up, the PCL is one of the two main cruciate ligaments and specifically the function of the PCL is to stabilize posterior translation of the tibia on the femur. So it stabilizes posterior displacement of the tibia on the femur. But it also has secondary effects. And at 90 degrees or in the flex position, it also is a stabilizer of external rotation and varus deformity. And so it has key mechanical qualities. And traditionally, prior to the advent of robotics, we would balance the PCL during knee replacement using a combination of rulers and blocks. And so this was essentially done by feel and by eyeball. So it was a very qualitative method of achieving balance. With the advent of robotic and computer assisted symptoms, systems, we now have a very quantitative method of balancing the PCL. And in this video, we're gonna take you through that process of using technology to create a symmetric and rectangular flexion gap. I think the best way to demonstrate a concept like this is by example. And so we'll take this specific instance of a knee, an unstable arthritic knee. And so specifically, this knee is in varus so it's bow-legged, it's subluxed. In other words, you can see how the tibia is displaced laterally on the femur, uh, and there's associated translation. So in this knee, there's not only arthritic change result with a loss of cartilage, we can also see there's bony deformity with collapse of the medial femoral condyle, as well as ligament con contractors. So a lot of deformity, a lot of things happening in this knee. And so we're going to take you through the stages of balancing. So number one, the individual anatomic sizing and alignment of component placement. And then number two, how we calibrate the soft tissue deformity and then make micro adjustments to achieve balance. And then number three, how we, can, how we confirm and then adjust for any asymmetries in the final stages. Step one starts with preoperative planning. And so this can be an intimidating slide, but it's because there is a lot of information being given to us. So in this slide, we're looking at the femur and the tibia in three different axes, coronal, axle, and sagittal axis. Um, what we will do prior to surgery is a process of what we call pre-op planning. From the CT scan, we will create a three-dimensional model. With this three-dimensional model, we will then apply a measured resection technique to implant sizing. So a measured resection technique to implant sizing, which means that we will remove the same number of millimeters of bone that will be replaced by the number of millimeters of implant. Okay. And so if we look, for example, at the femur, on the femur here, we know the composite thickness of the femoral replacement at the distal aspect is eight millimeters. So using this model, we will plan on removing eight millimeters of bone. If we look at the coronal image of the tibia, we know that we have the composite thickness of the tibial implant is nine millimeters. And so we'll remove seven millimeters of bone and account for the two millimeters of cartilage on the lateral side. Another thing that we'll do, for example, is we'll look at the sagittal view. This represents the posterior offset, and then we will choose the size of the implant that reproduces the outline of the posterior offset. We'll add three degrees of slope, and then we'll maintain neutral ro rotation. And then this is our anatomic starting point based on the patient-specific anatomy derived from 3D modeling. 
the next phase occurs dynamically during surgery. During surgery, we will then begin to characterize the patient-specific ligament deformity and extent of contractures. So we've done already the anatomic placement. Now we are looking at patient-specific deformity. And in this patient, at 90 degrees or 92 degrees of flexion, we can see that the patient has six degrees of varus here, but most importantly, has an asymmetry or an imbalance of the flexion gap. And we could have predicted that by looking at the x-ray, but we can see the medial side is five millimeters more contracted than the lateral side. And so this is a very asymmetric, unstable flexion gap. And so we will then begin to make small adjustments within the limitations of the anatomy to begin to correct this asymmetry. Now that we've recorded specifically the extent of quantitative deformity, which is five millimeters, 13 and 18, we will begin to make very small adjustments to the rotation and the position of implants to minimize the level of that deformity. So the first thing that we will do is that we'll add three degrees of varus to open up that medial space. And specifically because we're dealing in flexion, we will add two degrees of flexion relative to the posterior condylar ac axis, which is almost three degrees in terms of the trans epicondylar axis to open up that flexion gap. And then, then with those adjustments, we will put our trials in place and then take a clinical measure of our degree improvement. And we can see that we still have, with those adjustments, still four millimeters of imbalance between the medial and the lateral side. And so now we will begin the fine tuning. At this point, the fibers of the MCL have already been released. Osteophytes have been removed. We know the only remaining deforming force in this knee are the anterolateral fibers of the PCL. And so we'll take you through that balancing. So I'll show you how we release it diagrammatically, and then I'll try to give you a flavor of what's happening in the operating room. So the trials are in place. This is the femoral side. This is the tibial side. This is the PCL. This is the origin of the PCL. You can see the anterolateral bundle comes off the notch of the medial femoral condyle. It will then insert along the posterior tibial plateau one centimeter below the joint line. These are the fibers that are tight, that are creating the contracture and varus. We'll then gently release under a quantitative assessment, under robotic guidance, the anterior little fibers as they merge. So we're not cutting the ligament, we're just releasing the origin fibers until the knee is balanced. And so as we can see here, we have laminar spreaders in, we're looking at balance. These are computer trackers. So as we're releasing, we can see how the number of millimeters change and so that we can release until we achieve the symmetric rectangular balance and then stop. So with this amount of measurement, we, we will not over-release, we will not under-release. Now, this is the importance of having the robotic system with these quantitative measures, giving us the millimeters of deformity between either side. So under computer guidance, we will gently release the origin of the PCL until the medial and lateral sides balance. Once we know these are balanced, we also know that we have then corrected the deformity, the original arthritic deformity of the knee, and we have balanced the posterior cruciate ligament. What this looks like in surgery is this. Here we have the cut surface of the tibia. Here we have the cut surface of the femur. Here is the cruciate ligament. We put a laminar spreader in between, and we can see we have a symmetric gap between medial and lateral sides at this time. We will then show you in the next slide how we know that we've released this, the right amount without losing posterior stability and translation. Once the posterior cruciate ligament is balanced in the flexion plane and we've created a symmetric gap, we will then take the knee as well as the trials of the knee through a range of motion. Specifically, we are making sure that there is not excessive posterior translation. So we will put a backward force on the tibia and ensure that it does not displace relative to the femur as seen in this moving video.
Now, the beauty of these quantitative measurements is that it allows us to go from a deformed varus knee into a stable, balanced, well knee with a symmetric joint space. And you can clearly see how this knee is unbalanced. And this knee now with the appropriate releases and alignment placement is back in a neutral position with a stable gap between the bones. So in summary, the posterior cruciate ligament is an important component of a well-functioning knee. Again, it provides in a healthy knee posterior stability. It prevents the tibia from excessively translating on the femur. But in an arthritic knee, it becomes a deforming force. The complexity is balancing the right amount of release while still maintaining stability. This was always something very challenging to do prior to the advent of robotic technology, which gave us a quantitative measure of when the ligament was balanced. Now using robotic technology, we can do this with quantitative and direct vision to ensure that it's balanced every time. Thank you very much.